today's class we're going to continue the story of relativity. Uh, in last class, we talked about space and time in relativity. In this class, we're going to talk about velocity in relativity, and uh, especially the fact that there's a maximum velocity, the speed of light in relativity. We're going to talk about um, describing motion in relativity, and specifically um, energy and momentum in relativity. So this is the topics for today's class. So just a, a quick summary because we're going to build on this today. Um, we said that the foundations of relativity were the fact that the laws of nature were the same for everyone, no matter your reference frame, and that the speed of light is the same for everyone, no matter your reference frame. So that's the, that's the foundation of relativity. It led us to a couple of remarkable, amazing bizarre conclusions. One of the conclusions was that um, time is relative, depends on your reference frame. The other one is that length, distances, are relative, depends on your reference frame. Uh, in classical space-time, uh, then time intervals, distance intervals are absolute. Everybody agrees on it. In relativistic space-time, uh, time intervals, uh, distance intervals uh, are, are relative to the observer. So this kind of stretching or squeezing of space and time described by these formulas tells us how space-time works in, in relativity. And we can build on that and build on that and explore how motion works in relativity. For example, we can look at velocity in relativity, and that's going to be our first topic. And then we'll look at energy momentum in relativity. That'll be our a, a second, second half of the class. OK, so this first part of the class is about velocity. It's about adding velocities in relativity. I'm going to have to compare it to adding velocities in, um, in classical physics. Uh, and it's um, perhaps most importantly about this very strange feature in relativity that's very different from classical physics. In classical physics, in principle, you can go as you can go infinitely fast. So if you push something for long enough, uh, if you transfer enough energy for something for long enough, you could make it go infinitely fast. In relativity, you can't go infinitely fast. You can't go faster than the speed of light. Nothing can go faster than the speed of light. If you push something forever and ever, you could never make it go faster than the speed of light. If you transfer energy to something forever and ever, you could never make it go faster than the speed of light. So that's a really fundamental difference. OK, so I've got um, two slides now, a pair of slides. Uh, one of them's called Galilean Velocity Transforms Between Phrase. Looks, sounds very technical. Uh, the other one's called a Lorentzian Velocity Transforms Between Frames. That also sounds very technical. All, all they are, all they're about, is that how you transform a velocity or speed that's measured by one observer, a say me, to the velocity that another observer, say you, would observe. So imagine you're an observer and I'm an observer. We each have our observer reference frames, and they may be moving with respect to one another. So if I walk this way and then I walk this way, my, my reference frame is moving with respect to you. And um, the next two slides about, well, you know, if I see something moving with a certain velocity, what velocity speed do you see that something moving with? It's just that, that task. And we're going to do it in um, classical space-time, where we have an intuition about it, a common sense about it. And we're going to do it in um, uh, 
relativistic space-time, where we don't have that intuition, where we won't have that common sense about it. Okay, so this is the classical case. So Galilean velocity transforms are how you transform um, velocities uh, between different reference frames in classical physics. So let's take a, a look at this sketch here, and then this language down here, and then this equation here. So in this sketch, I'm imagining two different reference frames. I'm imagining a um, pedestrian reference frame. So here's the pedestrian. And I'm imagining this passenger in this truck's reference frame. And um, in this picture, this picture is kind of depicted from the perspective of the pe pedestrian reference frame. So their reference frame is at rest in this picture, and I've labeled it the unprime reference frame. Here's the space and time coordinates. And then this, um, this uh, passenger reference frame is indicated in green here. I've labeled it the prime reference frame. It's moving in this picture. You know, that's just one choice. I chose to draw the picture from the pedestrian perspective perspective. We could have drawn it from the um, uh, uh, passenger per perspective. One's not more privileged than the other in terms of these reference frames. Okay, so we've got two frames of reference, like we talked about, my frame of reference, your frame of reference, uh, and they're looking at this little birdie here. Uh, and this little birdie is flying over towards the um, uh, left hand, right hand side, and um, in blue, Vx, that's the speed of the bird as measured in the unprimed uh, pedestrian reference frame. And Vx prime in green, that's the speed that's measured by the um, passenger in the passenger, this green primed passenger reference frame. And so I've just stated that fact here, right? Uh, Vx is the bird velocity, bird's, bird speed, measured by the pedestrian, and Vx prime is the bird velocity speed measured by the passenger. We're going to call Vr the relative motion, the relative speed of the pedestrian <coughs> passenger frame with respect to the pedestrian frame. So that's this Vr here. That's this third velocity here. Um, we could also have drawn the picture from the other way around, from the perspective of the passenger uh, and a, a moving pedestrian frame. There would also be a speed VR difference between those two frames. It would just be that in the picture I drew, the passenger frame is moving towards the right. If we drew it from the passenger perspective, the pedestrian frame would be moving towards the left. But they'd be both moving either to left or right with this speed VR. This is the relative speed of the two reference frames. Downstairs here, this is technically, this is called the Galilean velocity transform. So it's a mouthful that means how you, can, how you take the velocity that's measured in the pedestrian frame, so that's the blue VX, and transform it into the corresponding velocity of the birdie as measured in the passenger reference frame. That's the, uh, the green Vx prime. And all you have to do is, is subtract off this relative velocity. That's accounting for the motion of the um, passenger frame with respect to the pedestrian frame. And so this is the Galilean velocity transform that takes you from velocities measured in one frame, say my frame, to velocities measured in your frame, the other, other frame. And it just accounts for the motion, the relative motion of the two frames. If there was no relative motion, then this is zero, and then the velocities are the same. I put a note down here, right? You have to be a bit careful about the signs of the velocities. Supposing we, as usual, call towards the right the positive direction, towards the left the, um, the negative direction then all of these velocity, well, then Vx in this picture, with the bird traveling towards the right, that would be positive. Vr in this picture, with the passenger frame traveling through the pedestrian frame to the right, that would also be a positive number. So you have to be careful about the signs in using this. Here's exactly the same thing, so I dangerously cut and paste the prior slide, 
and changed a few words in equations to make it into the new slide. Here's the same thing for transformations in uh, relativistic rather than classical space-time. So we've lost half the word, but um, this is the um, Lorentzian velocity transform between the frames rather than the Galilean transform between the frames, uh, meaning this is the um, relativistic velocity transforms rather than the classical velocity transforms. The picture's exactly the same. There's no, nothing different about the picture. Uh, we've got the pedestrian frame. We've got the uh, passenger frame. Passengers moving with respect to pedestrian or vice versa. I'm taking in this picture the perspective of the um, pedestrian reference frame. So I'm seeing the passenger reference frame move to the, towards the right. Um, the two velocities again, the one seen by the pedestrian is in blue, Vx. The one seen by the passenger is in green, Vx prime. And Vr in black here, that's their relative motion. So everything's the same, everything's exactly the same, except this is the transform. This is the equation, this is a more complicated equation, that uh, transforms the measured speed of the birdie by the pedestrian to the observed speed of the birdie as seen by the uh, passenger. So this is the new equation. This is the difference. The first piece of it in the numerator upstairs here is exactly the same. Right? We're just subtracting off from the pedestrian's birdie velocity the motion of the uh, passenger. But then we divide by this extra piece. So this is the new bit. This is the counterintuitive bit. This is, there's no common sense in this bit. You'd never imagine this bit. We divide by this thing here. Now, let me make a couple of comments about this thing that we're dividing by. Firstly, it's where the speed of light appears. So suddenly, this is where relativity is coming in, in, in this parentheses here, because you see this speed of light. Secondly, look at this second term in, in this parentheses here. It's the product of the, uh, a couple of velocities in the problem that I sketched, Vx and Vr, divided by c squared. Now, it's pretty obvious that um, if, if we're dealing with everyday velocities of the, um, the passenger with respect to the pedestrian and the birdie with respect to the um, uh, pedestrian, then the Vx, the Vr, are very, very small compared to the speed of light. And so this is very, very small numbers over very, very big numbers. And so this thing becomes essentially zero. And so for everyday speeds, this, this denominate, numerate, sorry, denominator is just one. And so it is the Galilean transform. But the difference is, the key thing is that if these speeds were of order of the speed of light, were approaching the speed of light, then this thing wouldn't be nearly zero. It would be non-zero. This quantity in parentheses here wouldn't be one. It would be less than one. And our transform would change. It wouldn't be the common sense transform. It wouldn't be the intuitive transform uh, that we've all grown up to uh, know and love or whatever. Anyway, so this is the new equation. Um, and really, this prior slide was a kind of a, a reminder of common sense. So let, let's look at a couple of examples. I won't work these couple of examples out on the device I don't know the name of because um, th there's not really much working out going on. But I, I'll use that later on when we talk about energy and momentum. Um, so in, in this particular art example, this is yeah, Austin Powers is one of you know those, those movies are you know the most movies I love. So that's why I put this in here, um, which probably says a lot about me. Uh, as I, as I explain it. Um, anyway, so in this picture, what are we imagining? Uh, we're actually imagining in this picture, firstly, two different reference frames. There's the Earth reference frame. So that's the one um, in blue here, unprime reference frame with space and time coordinates x and t. And then there's the, um, a second reference frame. That's Austin Powers' rocket ship 
reference frame. And um, uh, that's uh, this green reference frame here uh, that I've labeled the primed reference frame uh, at, with coordinates x prime, t prime. And so we got two reference frames, like when I introduced Galilean transformations or Lorentzian transformations, we had the pedestrian and the passenger reference frame. You know, uh, we can think of um, the Earth as the equivalent of the pedestrian reference frame and Austin Powers reference frame as the equivalent of the passenger reference frame. Austin is moving with respect to the Earth and the Earth is moving with respect to Austin. The relative velocity of Austin with respect to the Earth or the Earth with respect to Austin is eight tenths. 80% of the speed of light, 0.8 C. So this is not an everyday passenger, pedestrian, birdie problem. This is high velocity, near speed of light, Austin Powers, Dr. Evil, Earth problem. Okay, so they're not looking at a birdie uh, on Earth, and they're not looking at a birdie from uh, Austin Powers spaceship. They're looking at Dr. Evil. And um, Dr. Evil is traveling away from Earth over here. And he's observed to be traveling towards the right at speed of 90% of the speed of light from an Earth, Earthling, an Earth observer. You and I are looking at Dr. Uh, yeah, Dr. Evil. And he's traveling away at 0.9 C. And our question is simply, um, at what velocity does Austin Powers see Dr. Evil traveling towards the right at? So it's that simple question. Well, before we met relativity, we could try and answer this. And to answer it, we would use that, that equation for transforming velocities from one frame to another frame based on classical space-time. That's a simple equation. It's, it's this one here from uh, two slides ago, that uh, the velocity that Austin Powers will see uh, Dr. Evil traveling at, so that's Vx prime, is the velocity that the Earthlings, you and I see doc, uh, Dr. Evil traveling at, that's the Vx, less Austin's motion, the velocity, the speed of Austin's motion with respect to uh, Earth reference frame. So this equation here. Uh, so all we would do is plug in um, that, the, that you and I see Dr. Evil moving at 90% of the speed of light, that Dr. Evil is, sorry, Austin Powers is moving with respect to us in his reference frame at 80% of the speed of light, and so we'd be subtracting 80% of the speed of light from 90% of the speed of light, we'd get 10% of the speed of light. And so we would predict, based on classical space-time, that Dr. Evil's obviously catching, uh, sort of um, uh, following, uh, Austin Powers is following Dr. Evil, um, and uh, he's, he's, he's seeing Dr. Evil move towards the right at only one-tenth of the speed of light. That would be wrong for these speeds, because we need to account for relativistic space-time for these speeds. So here's the correct relativistic uh, transform. Uh, this is where I, I always, when I cut and paste slides, I always find in class is a mistake. This is an example of a Lorentzian transform now. So this is the relativistic case. Oh, hold on. Have I jumped two slides? I'm going the wrong way. Hold on. No, I did do it right. Uh, I was on, uh, just on the wrong slide. Um, and that's because I scheduled myself to be in two places at once, <laughs> which is also related to relativity. So it was kind of a nice demonstration. Anyway, here's the, um, here's the cal correct calculation I want to do, which involves um, uh, a Lorentzian transformation uh, in relativistic space-time. So exactly the same problem we're trying to solve. Here's the um, Earth uh, reference frame the unprimed reference frame in blue. Here's Austin Powers' reference frame, the prime reference frame in green. Here's a picture from the perspective of the Earth observer, you and I. We see Austin Powers is moving towards the right at 80% of the speed of light. 
Um, they're both you and I and Austin Powers looking at uh, Dr. Evil in his spaceship moving towards the right at 90% of the speed of light. But now, to calculate the speed that Austin Powers sees Dr. Evil traveling at, we're going to use the correct, the, the correct relativistic velocity transform. So fallen off the edge of the slide, of course, is the key thing that there's a Vx prime in green over here. Uh, that is um, the velocity that Austin Powers sees Dr. Evil traveling at. So this is the equation for Vx prime. Uh, this is the relativistic equation. We have the familiar common sense intuitive bit in the numerator, and then we add the extra relativistic bit in the denominator. And so all we've got to do is plug in... Um, what you and I see Austin Powers' motion to be, point CC, uh, and what uh, the relative motion of Austin Power in, in our reference frame is, is point 8C. Plug in these numbers, and so I've done that here. In the numerator, we get that familiar 9 tenths of the speed of light less 8 tenths of the speed of light. In the denominator, we get the new bit. It's 1 minus this product of um, Austin of the speed of Dr. Evil in the Earth reference frame. That's the point 9. And um, the point 8 is the speed of Austin Powers in the Earth reference frame. So this is no longer nearly 0. This is far from 0. And when you carry out this calculation, you get not point 0.1c, one-tenth of the speed of light, which we did relativistically. You get uh, 0.36c. So Austin Powers sees the um, Dr. Evil traveling at 36% of the speed of light uh, uh, from his reference frame towards, towards the right. So that's a, a big difference. So that was an example of velocities and velocity transforms in relativity uh, compared to classic, classically. And we see how that they're different. The equation that I quoted for the Lorentzian transform, a relativistic transform. Uh, I, I never derived that, but it's based on that, that prior class, that, that stretching or, or squeezing of space and time. That has consequences for velocity because velocity is distance over time. And so those consequences are represented in that, that new Lorentzian transform equation, that new relativistic transform equation. Um, the, the classical one is just common sense intuition for transforming velocities between frames when they're moving with respect to one another. Um, I've now got a, another pair of examples where I've replaced Dr. Evil with a light beam. And um, we're going to calculate this example with the light beam instead of Dr. Evil. From, from both the Galilean classical way of calculating it and also the relativistic Lorentzian way of calculating the velocity transform. The reason I'm doing a second one is because this is where these consequences for squeezing and stretching of space and time that led to a new velocity transform. This is where you see that they enforce that every observer observes light to be traveling at the same speed, at C. So we've said that light always travels at speed C. And so our, our transforms, our relativistic transforms, better demonstrate that light always travels at, at speed C. That counterintuitive, that unbelievable, that bizarre feature of, of light. Okay. So um, again, picture is two reference frames, the Earth reference frame, the unprimed blue reference frame, uh, the uh, Austin Powers reference frame, it's the green, the prime reference frame. They're moving with respect to one another. VR is the relative velocity. So my picture is from the perspective of you and I and Earth. Uh, we see Austin Powers moving at eight tenths of the speed of light. We could have drawn the picture from Austin's perspective, in which case he would see the Earth moving towards the uh, left at uh, eight-tenths of the speed of light. Uh, both the Earthlings and Austin are looking at this beam of light from this flashlight. 
we're told that the earthlings, you and I, measure this light to be traveling at the speed of light. So Vx, remember, is the velocity measured in the unprimed Earth reference frame, and it is the speed of light. And what we want to do is calculate the speed of light as seen by Austin Powers. And we're going to do it again, first wrongly, spending half the cars on doing things wrongly. Uh, I'm going to uh, calculate it wrongly in, with a Galilean transformation, and then we're going to calculate it rightly for a, um, correctly, for a um, Lorentzian transformation, a relativistic transformation. So here's the, the wrong calculation. So this uh, is the calculation you do in classical space-time, and the transformation to get the velocity that Austin sees, Vx prime, from the velocity that you and I saw, Vx, is you simply subtract off the r that describes the relative motion of Austin with respect to Earth. And so uh, Vx is c. Uh, Vr is a tense of c. And so we, the, the math here is always simple. We just got to subtract uh, from c a tense of c. We're going to get two tenths of c. And that's what classical physics would predict the speed of light as measured by Austin. And, and we know from last week, right, michelson morley experiment, that's completely wrong. Everybody measures the same speed of light. OK. <clears throat> so now let's, um, with our new understanding, do the correct calculation, the Lorentzian transform, the relativistic transforms of the velocities. So it's this equation here. I only partially lost, this time, the Vx prime. That's the velocity that Austin will see for the light ray. Um, and it's given by this equation involving what the Earthlings, you and I, see for the velocity of the light ray and the, and the relative motion of Austin with respect to us. And also it includes, just as a reminder, this is really the reminder that this is to do with relativity, that there's a speed of light in here. OK, so a little bit more complicated, but not really very hard at all. I'm plugging in um, the, the speed of light. I'm plugging in the uh, 8 tenths of the speed of light for Austin's motion with respect to Earth in the numerator. And then I'm plugging in the new bit that's in the denominator here. It's 1 minus this term here. Product of two velocities divided by c squared. Uh, the two velocities are the velocities measured from the Earth, the velocity of the light ray, the velocity of uh, Austin. Um, they're uh, 1c and 8 tenths c. You notice here, right, the c squareds and the denominators are canceling the, with the c's in the 1c one, one and 8 tenths c. So this is just a number here. And this number means that this, this denominator is... is Nowhere near one. It's far from one. And you can probably see here, right, that what we've arrived at is 0.2c in the numerator minus, sorry, divided by 0.2 in the denominator. So 0.2c over 0.2 is just c. So we suddenly found with our relativistic transformations that Austin also sees the light ray traveling with the speed of light. So we sort of come full circle here. We started out a week ago discussing Michelson-Morley experiment and the Michelson interferometer and it, how it led to the discovery that the speed of light is the same for all observers. And that seemed bizarre, counterintuitive, um, and, and wrong. Uh, Last class, Tuesday's class, we um, said we were going to try and um, solve that problem by adjusting or playing with space and time. That's what Einstein did, adjusted, played with space and time. Uh, and we ended up replacing, um, you know, a invariant time intervals that everybody agrees on, invariant lengths that everybody agrees on with relative time intervals and relative lengths, depending on your frame of reference. That has consequences for everything that's built on it, light velocity, light energy, light momentum. The consequences for velocity were our new velocity transforms. And we discover now, in coming full circle, that they do enforce 
the fact that the speed of light is, the seen, is seen to be the same speed for all observers. Look, Austin and the Earthlings are traveling at high speeds with respect to one another. At 80% of the speed of light with respect to one another. But they both see this light ray traveling at exactly the speed of light. Okay. So now the, the second topic uh, for today's class, which is sort of the second topic. So we're exploring the consequences of stretching, uh, squeezing space and time for the motion of bodies. We've explored the consequence for velocity, perhaps the most basic thing about the motion of bodies. Now we're going to explore the consequences for energy and momentum, which is tools that we use to describe uh, and understand the motion of, of bodies. It was energy and momentum were key when we were talking about Newton's laws for motion and understanding Newton's laws for motion. So that's the reason for talking about energy and momentum here. Uh, look, I've imagined this slide and next slide. I, I'm imagining this strange con conversation or chat, this like fireside chat between um, Newton and Einstein. Obviously, Newton um, was around in the 1600s, and, and um, uh, Einstein was around in the 18 and 1900s, um, so they obviously didn't chat. Uh, but it, they would have had an interesting chat, and it goes something like this. Um, so Newton's very proud of himself. Um, and um, he's proud of himself because, for one reason, um, he uh, came up with laws of motion that describe, explain, how forces, pushes and pulls, change the motion of an object. Um, an integral part of the understanding of how forces change the motion of the object is to think of um, forces as kind of agents of transferring energy and transferring momentum. And they transfer energy and momentum, but the way forces work is that whilst they are moving energy and momentum around from one owner to another owner, from one form to another form, they conserve energy and momentum. So, so they never destroy, they never create energy and momentum. They're just shuffling it around from owner to owner to, um, from disguise or brand to another disguise or brand. So this, this, uh, this is a great achievement. Um, now uh, Newton's worried, right? Because Newton's worried because his, his, under, his laws of motion and this understanding of energy and momentum is all based on a, a foundation. It's based on a foundation in which um, space-time is just kind of the, like this stage or this background on which all this action happens. Uh, and in this space-time stage or background, uh, intervals, time intervals between events, uh, everybody agrees on the time. You know, if I throw a ball in the air, no matter your motion with respect to me, we all agree how long it took to go up and come back down. Um, we all agree also on um, distances or lengths. So um, if we were to measure the length of the table, whether I, I'm walking past the table and doing it or whether you're standing by the table and measuring it, we all agree on the length of the table. I mean, so th the whole, whole of classical motion, the laws of motion, energy and momentum, is built on those basic notions of um, in what we would call invariant time intervals and invariant, um, invariant lengths. And now that's come crashing down. So uh, Einstein's uh, told us, Einstein's discovered that lengths aren't invariant. They depend on the frame of reference and that time intervals aren't invariant. They depend on the, fr the frame of reference. So What's going to happen to all of Newton's work? It's like kind of the dog has had his homework or something like that. All his work is about to be destroyed. He's worried. It turns out, though, that although there are 
massive changes in our notions of space-time in relativity. As I say, now time intervals are relative. Now lengths, spatial lengths, are relative. Now there's you know this other bizarre thing that we've uncovered in this class that in um, in classical space-time you could go infinitely fast in in principle. In um, relativistic space-time you can't go infinitely fast. You can go no faster than the speed of light. You can just approach the speed of light. So these are real fundamental differences between space and time, classically space and time, relativistically. Um, although all that's changed, actually the concept, the notion that forces transfer energy and forces transfer momentum, that, that remains. In relativity, forces still transfer energy and momentum. And the notion that um, energy and momentum are conserved quantities, that energy and momentum can't be destroyed or created, that's also true in relativity. In relativity, energy is conserved and momentum is conserved. So those basic concepts, notions uh, of understanding motion in terms of energy momentum transfer and energy and momentum conservation actually still hold. Um, all we have to do is modify our, our definitions and meanings for energy and momentum. We're just going to modify those definitions. Now, when we modify them, the interesting thing is that we've got to remember that at low speeds, low velocities, everyday velocities and speeds, um, the relativistic energy and momenta must become must turn into the classical energy and momentum. So we can't break that because Newton's laws of motion, concepts of energy and momentum work in our everyday world. So we can't break our everyday world, but we're going to have to modify the equations for energy and momentum to work in the high-speed world of approaching or order of the speed of light. This is the world of subatomic particles, of atoms and nuclei and smaller things. Okay, so let's, let's do relativistic momentum and then we'll do relativistic um, whatever the other one is, energy. Um, so this is a slide just to compare classical momentum with relativistic momentum. And upstairs here is the formula, the reminder of the formula for classical momentum. And here's the new formula for uh, relativistic momentum. And if you look at them, they're almost the same. There's just an extra factor in the relativistic formula compared to the classical formula is this factor that is the Lorentz factor. And in last class, I kept saying that you know, this, this Lorentz factor is going to keep cropping up, keep appearing in our relative work on relativity. Because it's that Lorentz factor um, that is a factor that contains the speed of light and compares the speed of light with your, your velocity. And it's that factor that we carry forward into the equations for, for example, relativistic energy and momentum to that, that encodes the modifications of those equations. If that factor becomes near 1 when the speeds are low, we're going to return to the old classical equations. If that factor, the Lorentz factor, is bigger than one, then we're in the world of uh, relativistic motion. OK, so um, these are the two, the new equation and the old equation for relativistic classical physics. Um, here's just a reminder, right, that in both cases, right, we still think of um, forces transferring energy and transferring me momentum. So that's um, still true. Uh, and forces still both conserve uh, energy and momentum in, in classical and relativistic physics. Um, we just have to, there's some detail here, if you want to track the conservation of momentum in relativity rather than classical physics, you have to track the conservation of not mv, as the classical momentum. You have to track the conservation of gamma mv 
which is the relativistic momentum. So if you imagine two billiard balls bouncing off one another, classical, in classical physics, you know, we'd calculate their momenta, MVs, for the two billiard balls. And the sum of their MVs for the two billiard balls would be the same after the collision as before the collision. In relativistic physics, if we got relativistic billiard balls bouncing off one another, then we would have to track their relativistic momentum. That's gamma mv. So we could calculate the gamma mv for the first billiard ball, gamma mv for the second billiard ball. We calculate the sum of that before the collision. We calculate the sum of that after the collision. And that would be conserved. That momentum would be conserved. Here's a picture showing or comparing the two equations for classical momentum and relativistic momentum. So uh, I've lost the axis up here. Um, that's, that's kind of unfortunate. But um, <laughs> this is momentum vertically. It just fell off the side of the slide. Uh, uh, this is momentum vertically. So imagine that is there. And then um, this is velocity horizontally in this graph. And so what I'm doing in this graph is plotting the moment. I'm imagining a particle. So maybe I'm imagining a billiard ball. And um, I'm changing the speed of the billiard ball. Or maybe I'm imagining, uh, more realistically, an electron or a proton. I imagine changing the speed of the electron and proton. And as I change the speed of the electron or proton or billiard ball, I'm walking along this axis here. This is the horizontal axis. This is the velocity or the speed axis. And upstairs here, hidden from view, I, I'm, I'm, I'm computing the momentum, the corresponding momentum. And I'm doing it for the classical formula for momentum and the relativistic formula for momentum. So in blue is the formula for the momentum given by mv. Okay, so this is just using the equation mv for, to calculate the classical momentum. In red, um, uh, it's the formula for relativistic momentum, gamma mv. So it's using that formula, gamma times m times v, to calculate the, um, the red line. Uh, what you see here is that at low momenta, right, relativistic momentum, classical momentum, uh, give the, the same result. And that's because that extra factor, Lorentz fa factor, if you're at low speeds, that's essentially, that's essentially one. So at low speeds, everyday speeds, speeds that are not near the speed of light, then um, classical and relativistic momentum are the same. You see a difference when you go towards order of speed of light, approach the speed of light, because then the factor gamma it's upstairs here. If V is approaching C, then this denominator is not 1. This denominator is a smaller number than 1. Gamma is a bigger number of 1. And actually, if you look at this equation here, you could see if, if V starts to really approach C, really get close to C, 99% of C, 99.9% .9 of C, the numerator starts to become really small. You get the square root of, if it's 99%, 0 0.01. Uh, you get square root of 0 0.001 if it's 99.9%. .9 so the numerator gets really, really tiny. Um, so gamma gets really, really big. And, and gamma actually approaches infinity as C, as V approaches C. So that means as the velocity starts to approach the speed of light, you start to depart from the classical momentum with this relativistic momentum curve. And actually, even if you made the relativistic momentum infinitely large, you kept pushing and pushing and pushing and transferring more and more momentum. This relativistic momentum equation is actually enforcing that, again, you can't go faster than the speed of light. Even at infinite momentum, the impossibility of infinite momentum by applying you know, infinite force over infinite length of time. Even at infinite momentum, you're just approaching the speed of light. So again, you see the, um, the speed limit of nature here. 
Okay, here's a quiz question. So in this quiz question, you're asked to think about um, relativistic speed and, or speed in relativity and momentum in relativity. And we're asked simply um, whether there's limits or there isn't limits on speed and momentum. So there's four combinations here, right? Uh, ranging from there's no limits on speed and momentum to there is limits on both speed and momentum and all the, all the permutations, all the combinations in between. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to think about that. We've been talking about it. Um, Okay, so I'll get going again. Relativistic space-time uh, changes our notions of velocity, changes our notions of momentum. One of the big changes is that there is a speed limit, so you can't go faster than the speed of light, but there is no limit on momentum. You could, by applying a force, longer and longer and longer, give something uh, approaching infinite momentum. So the, the speed has a limit. The momentum does not have a limit in, in force. And so the answer to this question would be, yeah, there, there is a limit on speed. You can't go faster than the speed of light. But there is no limit uh, on momentum. You could give something infinite momentum in principle. OK. Let's move on from relativistic momentum to relativistic energy. Uh, and like in relativistic momentum, where we had to modify the equation for momentum in, in energy, we're going to have to modify the equation for um, energy. And we'll discover some new and some interesting things. And actually, an equation that is, you know, everybody knows, probably the most famous physics equation. Uh, we'll discover e equals mc squared. OK. So um, I want to start with just um, a very basic question about uh, what, what is mass? You know, in 211, first semester, general physics, you talked a lot about mass. And in this class, maybe talked less about mass, but we've certainly talked about mass. But what is mass? And, and what is mass is an interesting question, because what is mass has evolved and changed over you know, the, the hundred years, hundreds of years since um, uh, Newton and others. So mass started out. The medium of mass probably started out with Newton as sort of a measure. I think I've got a slide on this. Yeah. Well, OK. It started out as maybe a measure of the quantity of some substance, the amount of substance, the quantity or amount of some material. So that's what, that's what 
say pre-Newton, uh, mass, mass reflected, mass measured. It's just how much of this uh, stuff you had, how much of this, these apples or oranges you had. Um, with Newton, there was a new understanding of uh, mass and the meaning of mass. For example, with Newton's laws of motion, when you calculate the acceleration due of an object, a body, due to a force acting on that object and body, that involves the, um, that calculation with F equals MA involves the mass of the body. Um, that gave us a new understanding of, of what mass is. So mass is kind of an inertia or a resistance or reluctance to having motion change. So, you know, a, a particle, an electron or a proton has a certain mass that describes its um, resistance, its inertia, its reluctance to having its motion change by an action of a force. You and I have masses. Uh, elephants and mice have masses that reflect their um, resistance, reluctance, inertia in terms of having their motion change. So this was a new understanding of mass that came from, from Newton. It, well, it wasn't just you know, an amount of apples or an amount of oranges, amount of substance or material. Um, it was um, a defined through this equation now, this formula now, F equals MA. Relatively further extended our notions of mass gave us a new understanding of the notion of mass. So as I say, probably the most famous physics equation, and not everybody knows F equals MA, um, but I, th I think pretty much everybody has heard of E equals MC squared. Uh, this is Einstein's famous equation that, that states the fact that mass is a, is a form of a brand of a type of energy you know, like um, motion has a, an associated energy. Uh, uh, like there's chemical energy, like there's thermal energy, and so on, so on and so forth. Mass is a, a, a form, a brand of energy. And the equation tells you if you've got a certain amount of mass, if the mouse has a certain mass or the elephant has a certain mass, then you can calculate the corresponding amount of energy associated with that mass by... Um, uh, the equation e equals mc squared. So there's a new understanding of, uh, of mass. And this emerged from, from relativity, from this change from classical space-time to, to relativistic space-time. Okay, so now I'm going to give you the e equals mc squared is the, is the bit of relativistic, and it, it is the, the most famous relativistic equation. Um, but it's actually a, a, a bit more complicated than that, so I want to give you the full story here. So the, the, the full story is um, here is the equation for the relativistic energy of, for example, it could be an electron, it could be a proton, so subatomic particles, or this could be the formula for the t total relativistic energy of uh, you or I or the mouse or the elephant. And that equation is gamma, again, gamma keeps cropping up, thanks, Lorentz, uh, Lorentz factor times mc squared. So this is actually the equation for the total energy of an electron, a proton, of you or I, or um, uh, the mouse or the elephant. Now, let's start thinking about this equation. This equation, this total energy, encompasses, embodies, an old familiar type of energy, kinetic energy, and this new this new type of energy associated with mass. So inside gamma mc squared is both the a contribution from the kinetic energy of a moving body and also the contribution of the mass's energy to, to the moving body. So both of those are, are built into that equation. So when we think of this total energy gamma mc squared, 
we think of it as incorporating, this is, I'm going to call this rest energy. But that means the energy associated with the mass of the particle. Uh, and uh, this is the familiar kinetic energy. This is the energy associated with the um, motion of the particle. And as we talked about, the energy associated with the mass of the particle is simply mc squared. So this is this contribution here. And the remainder, look, we've got gamma mc squared is the total energy. If mc squared of this gamma mc squared is the rest energy, then the remainder is gamma minus 1 mc squared. That's the kinetic energy. So this is an important equation upstairs here that contains a lot of new stuff. And so, you know, the first time, moment you see this, right, there's a lot to digest you're going to have to spend a lot of evenings over the next week or two just thinking about all the stuff that's encoded, embodied in this equation. Let me give you a few examples, right? This is a new formula for an old thing. We talked about kinetic energy before. Now we're talking about kinetic energy of an object again. Uh, the kinetic energy in classical physics was just one-half mv squared. Nice, simple, compact understandable formula, depends on the mass, depends on the moment, mo mass, and it depends on the motion, V, determines the amount of kinetic energy. Now we've got a new formula, it looks more complicated, it's gamma minus one factor times mc squared. Depends on the mass, depends on the motion, because there's a V in the gamma. Also depends on, again, this is typical of relativity, depends on the speed of light. There's a C in the mc squared. There's also a C hidden in the gamma, the Lorentz factor. So this is the new equation. I'm not going to prove it here. It's not hard to prove it. But if you imagine, so th that equation, that really I think it looks like a peculiar equation for a kinetic energy. Um, gamma minus 1 times mc squared. Firstly, you've hidden the velocity in the gamma, so that makes it look strange as an equation for the um, kinetic energy. And now you've got a c in it, a c squared in it. That makes it look strange as an equation for the kinetic energy. But if you took that little expression, gamma minus 1 mc squared, and you made an approximation of it, the approximation is let's approximate that v is much smaller than c. If you approximate V is much smaller than C in gamma minus 1 factor times mc squared, amazingly, amazingly, what you get is half mv squared. So that very strange gamma minus 1 mc squared does give you 1 half mv squared at everyday speeds, at you and I kind of speeds. So it, 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 it's not breaking any laws of classical physics. It's just um, telling you how kinetic energy works when you're approaching the speed of light, when you have order of the speed of light. So that's, that's this factor here. Um, so that, that's, the, so that's the, that term. And as I say, we've described the, this term is the, the concept, the idea that mass is a form, a brand, a type of energy. And if you have a particle electron, proton with a certain mass, that corresponds to a certain amount of energy. So that's, that's this piece here. Okay, let me just give you an example of the, the, the scale of these two contributions to the total energy of an object. So we said that now a, a, a moving object has two contributions to its energy. One is associated with its motion. We've been used to that. There's a new one associated with its with its mass, mc squared. We, w we weren't used to that. Um, uh, we're going to compare on this slide those contributions for kind of everyday objects at everyday speeds. And on a, another slide, we we'll compare the contributions for um, elementary particles at very high speeds. So I mentioned the mouse. A, a mouse weighs something like 50 grams. Um, and a mouse, I looked this up, can, can run at 10 miles an hour. That's faster than I can run it. 
which is a depressing fact. But anyway, um, the 50 gram mouse is running at 10 miles an hour. That's four and a half meters per second. Uh, and um, what we're going to do, what I did, is calculate, given that information, given that value of m, given that value of um, c, I can obviously calculate the rest energy, the corresponding amount of energy associated with the mass for the mouse. So that's the mc squared. And I can also calculate the kinetic energy of the uh, mouse. So I could use 1 half mv squared to calculate the kinetic energy, because 10 miles an hour is much slower than the speed of light. I mean, I could also use gamma minus 1 times mc squared to calculate it. It's more work. Don't need to do it, but I could just do it uh, and calculate the kinetic energy too. And so I did that. I didn't show you my calculation, but I, I wrote out the numbers. Um, the kinetic energy is uh, about half a joule. So, um, you know, a light bulb might emit, you know, 40 joules a second. So this, this mouse has um, half, half a joule of, of kinetic energy. The mass energy, mc squared, that's an enormous, an enormous amount of energy. In that respect, the, um, the mouse is in an enormous store of energy. So when you calculate mc squared for the 50 gram mouse, you get about 5 times 10 to the 15 joules. So that, in, in this world, everyday world, of our running mouse, well, it has, it has energy associated with it, energy associated with its mass, energy associated with its motion. The energy associated with the motion is tiny, tiny, tiny in comparison between the energy associated with its mass. So mc squared far, far, far outweighs gamma minus 1 mc squared in this particular case. Okay, so that, that was um, a comparison of um, kinetic energy, mass energy. We could have calculated the total energy, but it was all the mass energy anyway. Uh, calculate a comparison of those energies in the world of the, the, the everyday world of the moving mouse. Now we're going to do the same. Now we're going to go to um, Chicago. We're going to go to the outskirts of Chicago, west side of Chicago, and we're going to go to a national lab called Fermilab. Um, and so it's a big lab with a giant accelerator, massive accelerator. Around the ring of the accelerator is more than um, uh, three miles. And in this picture, you can't see it very clearly, but this ring here is this giant accelerator. And this ring, they turned it off now, but uh, this, <laughs> they turned it off, but it used to send protons around in one direction, and an amazing thing, antiprotons, antimatter protons around in the opposite direction, and they used to collide them. Um, the protons that go round, that went round, the Fermilab accelerator, it's called the Tevatron, the Fermilab Tevatron, are traveling at very, very, very close to the speed of light. So they're actually traveling, so we don't normally say, when we talk about these protons, you know, in the, up on the third floor, with my colleagues, we're talking about these protons. We wouldn't normally say that they're traveling at 99.9999 whatever percent of the speed of light. We'd say they're gamma factor. Gamma, remember, gamma for everyday speeds is one, about one, well, very close to one, just fractionally bigger than one. Uh, gamma for these protons is much, much bigger than one. It's actually 400. So the Lorentz factor for these protons um, is, is 400. And um, based on that, what we're going to do is calculate um, three things. Uh, we're going to calculate the proton rest energy. We're going to calculate the proton kinetic energy. We're we'll also calculate proton total energy, like we did for the mouse. The mouse is kinetic energy. The mouse is uh, rest energy. Uh, and, and we could have calculated the um, mouse's total energy, but it was the same as the rest energy. 
Um, the other thing that we need to do this calculation is that we do need the mass of the proton. Um, the, the mass of a, I, I've written it down here. So the, the mass of a proton, but I've written, it, I've, I've written it down here, and I've written it down wrongly here. This is 1.67, not 2.67. So this is wrong. This will get corrected. Um, the mass of a proton is, is obviously tiny in everyday units of kilograms. It's, it's 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27. So that's point, then a huge number of zeros, and then um, 1.67. So it's a very, 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 very tiny mass in kilograms. Um, when we talk about um, subatomic particles, electrons, protons, nuclei, atoms, that, that sort of stuff, um, we often use different units from our kilograms and um, our, our meters and our joules, etc. And the units of mass that we often use is electron volts divided by, divided by the speed of light squared. So electron volts or over C squared. Um, in this particular case, I'm using MeV, mega electron volts over C squared. That's million electron volts over C squared. That's going to be more, much more convenient for us to work with when we think about the, uh, the mass of the proton than working in units of kilograms. We could do all this in kilograms, but it's much easier to do this in MeV over C squared. So downstairs here, 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms is a nice everyday number, 938 mega electron volts over C squared. This is a mass. This is a units of mass. And there's 938 MeV over C squared owned by every proton in the universe. OK, so with this information, let's go ahead and, um, uh, and, and calculate the rest energy, kinetic energy, total energy. Uh, I'm going to do this on the device I don't know the name of. Okay. OK, so I'm going to start by writing down two numbers. The mass of the proton, we said, is nice everyday number, 938 MeV over C squared. The other number I'm going to write down is the gamma factor of our protons in the tevatron that is now shut down. So um, they didn't tell me the gamma factor in the question, but they did tell me the gamma factor in the question because they told me that the total energy is 400 times the rest energy. The rest energy is mc squared. The total energy is gamma mc squared. So if um, total energy is 400 times rest energy, then gamma must be, that's the only difference in the two equations, gamma must be the 400. So they tried to hide it, but they couldn't hide it. The Lorentz factor is 400 here. OK, so that's the information we know. Um, so let's go ahead and calculate the three energies. Rest energy, RE. Uh, remember, that's mc squared. That's the famous equation of Einstein. We now know gamma mc squared, so we're ahead of, you know, 99.9% .9 of uh, everybody else. Doesn't want to know that. Um, doesn't care about it. Um, anyway, uh, so we've now just got to multiply 938 MeV over c squared. That's our mass in the um, units of mega electron volts over c squared by c squared. This is the beauty of these units. This, is, this all, always makes me feel um, warm and fuzzy, <laughs> maybe. Um, because look, I got a C squared in the numerator, and I got a C squared in the denominator, and the C squared in the numerator will just cancel with the C squared in the denominator, and I'm just left with 938 
MeV. MeV, mega electron volts, like electron volts, is a unit of energy. You know this from chemistry. Um, and so this is the um, rest energy, 938 mega electron volts of a proton. If we were working with kilograms, then good luck. Um, this would be more work than C squared over C squared. So that's why we do it. Uh, and now I've forgotten what I'm doing. Oh, total energy. TE for total energy. That was gamma mc squared. This is the thing that we, we're a small group now, that only, we're the only ones that know this compared to the population. So gamma mc squared is the total, total energy. Um, all we've got to do now is multiply, uh, well look, this mc squared was the rest energy, so I know that it's 9, 938 MeV. All I've got to do is multiply it by the gamma factor, 400, and um, that 400 times 938 MeV, and I've already, because I'm super well prepared for class, well, actually I wasn't, but um, because I scheduled myself to be somewhere else, um, but this is 375,000 MeV. And so that's the total energy of the, total energy of our um, proton in the tevatron that's turned off. Uh, finally, the um, kinetic energy. We said we were going to calculate the kinetic energy. There's a couple of ways I could do this, but perhaps the most intuitive way is remembering that, well, look, the total energy is the sum of this rest energy and this kinetic energy. And so kinetic energy itself is just the total energy less the rest energy. So I can just subtract these two numbers. I could also do this calculation by kinetic energy equals gamma minus 1 times mc squared. But I'll, I'll do it this way. I've just got to take from 375,000 MeV a tiny amount, 938 MeV. I'll call that 1,000 MeV. So I'm going to get 374,000 MeV approximately. And so this is the solution to that problem. Um, this is the opposite situation. This is completely the opposite situation from uh, the mouse. The mouse overwhelmingly was rest energy and underwhelmingly was kinetic energy. The proton is overwhelmingly kinetic energy and underwhelmingly, um, underwhelmingly uh, rest energy. Uh, let me just calculate one extra thing, just to stop you leaving, <laughs> I guess. Uh, especially after I said I couldn't arrive on time. I'll, st I'll stop you leaving. I'm going ca to calculate, um, we know gamma factor. I'm going to calculate the speed. I'm going to calculate the speed of this proton. So if you rearrange this equation for the gamma factor, you, you, can, you can calculate the, um, the speed. I've already rearranged it. I'll just write it down. The speed, or the speed of the proton divided by the speed of light, is just actually 1 minus 1 over gamma squared. So rearranging the equation on the left, Try this at home, you'll get this equation on the right. V over C equals square root of 1 minus 1 over gamma squared. Uh, if you plug in the gamma of 400, you find out that those protons at the Fermilab accelerator, called the Tevatron, that's now turned off, are traveling at, oh, I wrote it down wrong, 